Yeah. Thank you for singing to Jesus with us. Well, as you may have noticed, because Kari is the best worship leader in the history of the world, the songs all had a king theme to them because this is Epiphany Sunday. Now, that may not mean anything to some of you. If you came from a more liturgical background, you will understand that. But Epiphany Sunday is the Sunday that we historically celebrate the wise men or the magi or the we three kings of Orient are. They came to Bethlehem to worship Jesus. Um, in the nativity scenes, you'll see there are the wise men with Jesus, but that's not historically how it happened. They actually came afterwards, maybe as much as two years afterwards. And so this morning, we will be looking in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, at the wise men and King Herod on their visit to Jesus. And my title this morning is Jesus the wise men seek him. When I was a child, we had this little bitty Christian bookstore in our town of Lancaster, Wisconsin, population of about 3,500. And they had these little lame, cheesy toys to amuse children. And so my mom bought me one of these little lame, cheesy toys. And one of them was this little square box with like nine openings, <clears throat> excuse me, but eight squares, and then you'd have to move them around, and you'd have to put the puzzle together and have to make sense of it. And one of my puzzles was, had these words with a picture of an owl, wise men still seek him. And I had no idea what that was talking about, because I'm six. I'm like trying to get these squares. <laughs> Wonder why there's an owl in there. I didn't know an owl represented wisdom, but now I know. It was saying, once upon a time, the wise men sought Jesus, and today, wise still seek Jesus. And that's my big idea. My big idea today is that I hope that you are seeking Jesus, and I have good news for you. The fact that you are here this morning means in some way, at some level, you are seeking Jesus. It says in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so I want to encourage you and thank you for having the fear of the Lord and being here and seeking Jesus. And now let's look at what happened 2000 years ago. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Now, I'm going to, you know, like have a running commentary on this and I'm going to explain things as we're going. And the first thing I want to explain is King Herod. Herod was actually a title, much like Pharaoh is a title or president is a title. Now, I know it sort of seems redundant to say now in the time of king title, Herod title. But this was Herod the Great. And he wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people. He was not himself Jewish. Actually, he was an Edomite. And I'm sure that cleared everything up. But for those, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> oh, that makes perfect sense. He's an Edomite. But for those who don't know what an Edomite is, going back to Abraham, by the way, next week we restart our series on the life of Isaac. But going back to the time of Abraham, we have Abraham. He's called by God. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name is changed by God to Israel. Esau also has a second name. He's called Edom because of his hair. The, the yeah, well, he's a hairy boy. The children of Israel are called the Israelites. Esau's descendants are the Edomites. So they're these brother nations. And the Edomites were actually defeated quite soundly in war because they refused to help the Israelites. But there's some Edomites that still survived. And one of those Edomites was the man that grew up to be King Herod. And he wanted to gain favor with the Jews. He wanted to ingratiate himself. That's like the biggest word I've ever used in church. <clears throat> he wanted to win favor with the Jews. 
And he also had to make the Romans happy. I know this is it's like you're watching 2020 with Barbara Walters or something. But see, the Romans, they were the political power of the world at this day. We all live in Minnesota, lovely, frozen Minnesota. Imagine if the Canadians conquered us and they hauled us off to Canada. But then they, after a while, said, well, you guys can go back to Minnesota and you can, you can live in Minnesota now, but you're under Canadian rule and you will sing God Save the Queen. That's what happened with the Israelites. They had been taken off into captivity by the Babylonians. Then they were allowed to come back to their land, but they never owned it. They were not the political rulers. They were living in what was at this time the Roman governed world. And Herod was put in power by the Romans. And so he wanted to do everything he could to gain favor with the Romans, because if the Romans weren't happy with him, he wasn't going to be King Herod for very long. But he also wanted to appease the Jews. So he did wonderful things. He like, he, he, well, we actually call it Herod's temple. He rebuilt and remodeled the temple of the Jews, and he made it a glorious place so that it is called Herod's temple because he wanted to gain favor because he wished that he was Jewish, but he was also a ruthless man who feared losing his power. In fact, he murdered some of his own sons. He killed a couple of his wives, even one wife that he really liked, apparently. There was like 45 others. He he wanted to hold on to his power. So he's trying to keep the Romans happy. He wants to be the king of the Jews. He's building up and he's kind of walking this tightrope. And this all happens during the time of King Herod. And then the next word, magi. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Who are the magi? Well, historically, we have called them the wise men or the kings. I will refer to them as the wise men, not on purpose, just because that's what I've called them my whole life. And so it'll just automatically come out wise men. But I'm talking about the magi. Magi is a word that we get our English word magic from. Yeah, I didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> Now, who are these magi? Well, we don't exactly know, but I will tell you what I believe to be true, and I think I can support this biblically. I believe they were the, they were the, the wise men, the magi, from around the Babylon area. And here's where I get that idea from. It's not my idea only, but I think it's a good idea. If you go back into the book of Daniel, chapter 2, Daniel was a young man who lived about 600 BC, so about 600 years before this story happens. And in 593 BC, he was hauled off into captivity. He was taken from his lovely home of Israel off to Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar, who at that time was the most powerful man in the world, he wanted to grow the greatest nation that he could. And so when he took, when he conquered Israel, he took the brightest and the best. He took the people with gifts and skills and abilities. And one of the young men that he took was Daniel. And so Daniel is hauled off into Babylon. He's in captivity. He's trying to make his way in this new world. He's an alien in a, in a strange place. He's going to the Babylonian schools to learn everything that he can because King Nebuchadnezzar wants to train his men so he has the brightest and the best. And we get to chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, and Daniel has risen into the elite of Babylon. He has become one of the wise men of Babylon. So in chapter 2 of Daniel, you can read the story later today, in chapter 2 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and it haunts him, and he doesn't know what to do with this dream. So it says that he calls the enchanters and the astrologers and the sorcerers of Babylon, and he calls them in and he says, I had a dream, and I need someone to interpret my dream. However, I'm not going to tell you what my dream was. Because if I tell you what my dream was, you can just make up anything. So 
You will tell me what my dream was, and then you will interpret my dream. And if you don't, I will cut you to pieces and turn your houses into rubble. And they're all like, oh, great king. Nobody can do what you're asking. There's no one on earth who can tell the king what he dreamed and interpreted his dream. Tell us your dream and we'll interpret it for you. And he says, you're just stalling. Hurry up or you're all going to die. And word gets to Daniel that all of the elite of Babylon are going to put to death unless somebody can interpret and tell the king what he dreamed. Daniel goes to his friends and they pray and they pray and they pray and they cry out to God, God, please help us. And in the night, God reveals to Daniel what the king's dream was. And Daniel and his friends just praise God and thank him. And they send a message to the king and they say, King, we can, we can tell you what your dream was and we can interpret it for you. And the king says, okay, Daniel, how can you do this? He says, well, actually, I can't do it. There's no one alive that can do this. But there is a God in heaven. And he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he's the revealer of men's dreams. And he showed me what your dream is. And he has given me the interpretation. And he wants you to have this because he wants you to know the events that are coming. And Daniel says, this is what happened. You were laying in your bed, O oh great king. And you saw a statue with a gold head and its torso was made of silver, and its legs and thighs were made of bronze, and it's, it's, what do you call the bottom part of your leg? I should know that, I have, I have, yeah, there we, thank you, wow. I just like, boom, I'm just saying, like, your sticky pointy things on the bottom <laughs> with toes. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, that's what I call them, I'm from Wisconsin, that's how we roll. <laughs> The sticky pointy things with toes were made of iron mixed with clay. And then, O oh great king, you saw a rock that was not cut out with human hands. And this rock came and smashed the toes and smashed the legs and the statue crumbled into nothing and the wind blew it away as if it was chaff. And this rock that was not cut by human hands grew and became a mountain that filled the earth. And this is what your dream means. You, O oh great king, are the head of gold. And after you will come a kingdom inferior to yours. And after that kingdom will come another kingdom, stronger but still inferior. And then you get to the bottom and it is iron, but the, the toes are mixed with clay and it will be a frail kingdom that will fall. And he, he was talking about the Romans. And during the time of the Romans, he said, he, Daniel didn't say the Romans, we know he's talking about the Romans. And then he said, this rock not cut by human hands will come and smash these kingdoms. And that is God saying he at this time will establish his kingdom and it will endure forever. And Nebuchadnezzar was like, Whoa, there is nobody, there is nobody like you, Daniel. You talk to God. And so Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel the number two in Babylon. He put all of the wise men of Babylon under Daniel. And it only makes logical sense that Daniel, who is so devoted to his God, is going to teach all of his wise men where he gets his wisdom. We know that Daniel never backed down. That's why we sing about Daniel, because three times a day, he would open his windows to Jerusalem and he would pray in front of everyone to his creator, God. And so it's very logical that Daniel would use this authority, especially since Nebuchadnezzar understood it came from his God. And he would teach all of the elites of Babylon about his God. And there's a problem prophecy in the book of Numbers. How many of you remember the story? Maybe none of you. The talking donkey, you know, Balaam, he had a donkey that talked. Well, when Balaam was out prophesying over Israel, one of the things that he said in Numbers chapter 24 was, there's one who is coming, but he's not here. And he will rise like a star 
in Judea and he will reign. And so it seems logical that Daniel understood this is representing the future Messiah and that his dream about this kingdom that is going to fill the earth is representing the future Messiah. And so it seems very logical that he shared these things because he's wanting to disciple his wise men. He wants to turn the enchanters and astrologers into followers of his God. And Daniel was in 600, probably died around 540, 530. And the years go by, and the years go by, and the years go by, and the years go by. But those who were trained by him, and trained by those who were trained by him, and trained by those who were trained by those who were trained by him, they keep looking to the east. They keep looking to the east. They keep looking to the east. They're waiting because they know a kingdom is going to be set up. A king is going to be born and he's going to rule everything. And then one day they come because Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Because we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him and the star. I won't talk a lot about the star. There's a very interesting documentary. Uh, the man's name is Larson. It's called the star of Bethlehem and he's used astronomy software and he's played the skies back in time and he believes he's found what the star was. He, he believes it was Jupiter that was actually going around Regulus, which is the king star. So we have the king planet and the king star. And then as the earth moves, this is the earth rotating, okay? <laughs> Orbiting, I'm sorry. As the earth does that, you know how when you're, if you pass somebody on the highway, they're like going fast and you go faster. And as you go faster, it looks like they're going backwards. Well, that's what happens with the planets. See, the stars all stay where they are, but the planets are closer and they're moving around. And so as earth would pass, it would look like, it stops, but it doesn't really stop. It's just the earth is in a different place. So he says, where is the one born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. Now, if you are King Herod and you want to be known as the king of the Jews, you're doing everything you can to win the Jews over to you and keep the Romans happy. How do you feel? about hearing that there was this baby born king of the Jews and that the heavens are moving and declaring that he is the king of the Jews. Herod wasn't too happy about this. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now, it's, it's more likely when it says all Jerusalem with him, not everyone in Jerusalem was whipped in a frenzy, but that King Herod and his people were whipped in a frenzy. And if Herod is the kind of guy who runs around just killing people to stay in power and you're one of his, his cronies, yeah, this is a little frightening. We say things like Washington, D.C. is in an uproar. It doesn't mean everybody in Washington, D.C. We know what it means. Well, it seems that all of Jerusalem was disturbed disturbed. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests, because now he's seeking the Jewish leaders. He wants the rabbis, the men who have studied the law. He calls them all together. And he says, where is the Messiah to be born? Tell me. And think about what he just said. There is a Messiah. I know that because I just asked you where he's going to be born. Where is the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And then they go, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So now Herod knows not only is there Messiah, not only have the heavens moved and declared his birth, but there were ancient prophecies that said a Messiah would come and told them where he would come from. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. 
After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped. And again, that would seem to be the time when the earth passed and Jupiter's movement seemed to stand still until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. These are full-grown men, probably 50 years old or older, full-grown men who have traveled 700 or so miles, and they've brought with them expensive gifts, and they are men of standing and position because we know them as the Magi as the wise men, and they follow this star. They're following a star. They're looking for a sign in the sky, and they follow this star, and they find this house. And when they do, they are overjoyed. And I don't think they were overjoyed. Well, I had a, quite a few years ago, one of the guys I know had heart surgery down at Abbott, and the doctor came out and he said, we are thrilled with the results. And I'm like, you look thrilled. You, you really look excited about this. I don't think the Magi were thrilled like the heart surgeon. I think they were overjoyed. They were like, this is unbelievable. We heard about this and we've been looking and we would look up night after night after night after night. And then one night we saw a star rise in the east and we thought that might be it. And we followed and here we are and we have found him and full grown wealthy men worship a baby. That seems sort of strange, but they knew what had been promised and they believed the prophecies and now with their own eyes, they were seeing it and they worship him and they present him with these gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And then having been warned in a dream, and I think this is really interesting. They were warned in a dream. See, God knew how to reach them anytime. When he wanted them to know not to go back to King Herod, that's what it says. They were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. And what this tells me is that any time God wanted to, he could have given them a dream. They could have had a dream way back before they ever went on the journey. Could have laid out everything, but God didn't give them the dream. He wanted them to search and to seek. He wanted them to dig in. He wanted them to pursue, and they did. And they found this babe in Bethlehem. And now they're warned to go back another way, so they did. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, Joseph obviously being the father. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph has this dream and he's like, oh, imagine being Mary. So he got up. He took the child and his mother during the night. It's like, Mary, Mary. It's like, oh, it isn't Joseph. I'm tired. Mary, get up, get up, get up. What, what, what? We have to go. Why? An angel and a dream. And Mary's like, yep, I've heard that story before. Let's go. Off they go to Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, Matthew, he wrote his gospel to the Jewish people. Each gospel was written with a slightly different, different audience in mind. And Matthew wants to prove to the Jews that Jesus truly is the Messiah that they have been waiting for. And so whenever Matthew can, he wants to put prophecies that prove this. And here he just sticks in this prophecy. Yep. See, out of Egypt. I called my son. Verse 16 says, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. If any of you remember the story from the King James Version, it says, he was exceeding wroth. That sounds bad. Like, you don't want to be exceeding. You don't want to be wroth, but you definitely don't want to be exceeding wroth. 
he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. And then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled because Matthew wants to prove that Jesus is the one they've been waiting for. And then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice it heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning, Rachel. And you say, who is Rachel? Well, remember we talked about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Rachel was one of Jacob's wives. She was one of the mothers of the nation of Israel. And so these are her descendants being wiped out. And then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So I think, okay, what did Herod know? I've told you. He knew there was a sign in the skies he knew that there were men that studied the skies that had ancient learning that were the magi, the wise men. And they had traveled hundreds of miles to find this child. He knew that the one promised was the Messiah. The Messiah. And he knew this Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. And he knew this Messiah born in Bethlehem that the heavens spoke about was the king of the Jews. And Herod decides, I will get rid of him. How do you win that fight? How? If, if the heavens move for him, I mean, I don't know how many of you can control the movements of stars and planets. I cannot. Herod could not. How did he possibly think this was a fight he could win? And was it even really worth fighting? He's an old man. He actually only lived about another year or two. Is it really worth fighting? What kind of power did he have that he had to hold on to that tightly that he's going to just wipe out all the boys two years and under in that vicinity? It doesn't even make sense to me. It really doesn't. And then you have these wise men. And they aren't steeped in the Old Testament scriptures because they're not Jewish. They don't have the history of Moses and David. They have whatever they were given from Daniel. They have these beliefs that they have been taught. They have the signs, but they are so moved that they say, whatever it is, it's worth us making a journey. And again, 700 miles, that is far in a car. It's really far by camel or donkey through the desert. And they did not waver. They stayed the course until they found this child. And then... They worshiped him. And the silly part of the story is it's where the world still is today. See, I would love to tell you that nobody wants to kill Jesus anymore, except he's been hated. I mean, not only did Herod try to kill him about 33 years later or 30 so years later, Pilate did. The religious leaders of the Jews shouted out, crucify, crucify. And when Pilate said to them, you want me to crucify your king? Their answer was, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. And just because they physically crucified him, it didn't stop anything. Because three days later, the stone was rolled away and the earth shook. And the angel sat and said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? dead and it still goes on today richard dawkins the the militant atheist in an interview with ben stein he said that he was so free when he finally got rid of the idea of god it set me free and it's not just dawkins i actually have a quote i will read because i can read 
My mama taught me well. My dad helped too. This is a quote from Thomas Nagel, who's a professor at the University of New York. He's a professor of philosophy and professor of law. And this is what he says. I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true. And I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God, and naturally, I hope that I am right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I do not want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. My guess is that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition. <laughs> no, it's not. Who wants a cosmic authority? My guess is this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition and that it is responsible for much of the scientism and reductionism of our time. One of our tendencies it supports is the ludicrous overuse of evolutionary biology to explain everything about human life, including everything about the human mind. That's what he's saying. I don't want there to be a God. Here's the problem. Just because someone gets exceeding wrath about something doesn't change it. See, if I crash my car into a tree, I can get out and I can be angry and I can be mad and I can be like, who would plant a tree here? And who would put a road next to a tree? And I mean, I'll be mad at everything except why didn't I stay on the road? But it doesn't change anything. And I'm going to tell you the truth. There's a rock not cut out by human hands, and it will smash every earthly kingdom, and it will grow to be a mountain that fills the earth. And you get to decide, will you worship? Will you seek him? Or will you hope he's not real? And you are all here, which means in some way you are seeking him. And this morning, it is my great honor and privilege to get to offer to you to partake of his body and his blood. Because you see, he didn't stay a baby. He grew up and he was a man and he was on the cross and they shouted crucify and they did crucify. And he told them before it was going to happen the night before he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And if you need sins forgiven, if you need hope, if you need joy, if you need love, if you need peace, then I invite you Partake, partake of the one who is our peace. The worship team will come, they will play, the servers will pass out. We'll pass out the bread first if you would hold the bread and then we will all partake together. And after that, we'll pass out the cup and do the same thing. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you for being who you are. And thank you that you are so great that you raise nations up and you take them down. And you weren't surprised by the Babylonian Empire. And you weren't surprised by the Persian Empire. You weren't surprised by the Greek Empire. You weren't surprised by the Roman Empire. You aren't surprised by what has happened at all. You are working and you are calling us to you. So please give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In your name, Jesus, we pray.